Also, we're live streaming on YouTube. You can click the link and get the link. You can get, click the, the icon top left on Zoom and get the link if you want to share it elsewhere before we start. All right, it's time, I guess. So let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to share with you all some of our ideas and insights on these topics of science fiction, futures literacy, and technological innovation. Together with me today is Roger Spitz, who will be presenting himself in a while. But just to introduce myself first, my name is, oh, sorry, Lidia Zwing. Uh, I am a Brazilian journalist. Uh, I hold a master's degree in semiotics and I'm finishing my PhD in visual arts currently. Um, I'm also a senior researcher at Envisioning, who is hosting this panel with us. And I am also chair of Center for Science Fiction at Disruptive Futures Institute, alongside Roger. Uh, some of the themes I have been studying for the past 10 years include topics such as transhumanism, science fiction. I am both a writer and a researcher. And besides emerging technologies, consumer behavior, and I also use methodologies such as NASA's TRL, which means technology readiness level, and we will address this methodology along the panel, uh, and also design fiction as a means to discuss future scenarios. So now it's Roger. Fantastic. Nothing as interesting as Lydia, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> so I spent 20 years in investment banking. I was uh, advising shareholders, CEOs, and boards on some of the strategic transactions, venture capital, acquisitions, divestments, strategic investments, and uh, covering glo globally technology sector for that. Um, so I'm now seeking forgiveness and redemption and trying to do something more interesting than all that. I still spend time, I'm based in San Francisco, still spend time with a lot of the companies and the VC, VC world and startups here in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere. And my primary focus today, um, having led investment banking after two decades, is foresight strategy through Tech Existential, which is technology and existential as an aim, 
And I work a lot with boards and investors and work a lot on the future of leadership, future of governance and ethics foresight, technology foresight, and those topics. And what Lydia mentioned as the Disruptive Futures Institute is um, it's a think tank and platform where we try to help understand, anticipate and navigate disruption. We believe that disruption has become a steady state as opposed to a single or recurring event. While most of the world continues to see educational systems and businesses and governments operate as if the world was stable, was linear, was predictable. So we integrate futures and foresight, complexity and systems thinking, science fiction, as well as philosophies and Buddhism and uh, areas such as exponential technologies to try and help um, provide tools to drive and to thrive on disruption to understand how to deal with what is a complex, non-linear and unpredictable world. But that's okay, those are actually good things. Um, it helps you with the agency, inspiration, it helps you with curiosity and experimentation. So we see it as a very positive um, element to drive imagination and agency. So on that note, I think um, Lydia will want to introduce our hosts in Visioning who are organizing the session with us. Yes, exactly. So at Envisioning, our purpose is to be able to amplify voices, ideas, knowledge, build new skills, and allow people to structure intelligent alternatives for the future. We want to encourage people to go further, to come overcome poverty the end of the imagination, and to rethink behavior, applying creative and innovative initiatives to deconstruct certainty of the present and create a new future. This involves thinking strategically, doubting, uh, doubting, talking, understanding people, politics, and culture. Uh, we are the first world, uh, we are the world's first collaborative intelligence platform for emerging technologies. And we have a global team spread throughout the world in, in countries such as Brazil, United States, Germany, Spain, and so on, always growing. And here are some of our clients. And basically what we, we do is mapping emerging technologies and ranking them according to uh, levels of readiness, both the NASA's technology readiness level and a proprietary methodology of readiness for technologies. And what we do is trying to identify technologies that are, could be one science fiction, and then they can become more than ideas to become concept and then a prototype and a product. So it goes from science fiction to science fact. We have a platform with more than 1,000, 1,000 technologies, emerging technologies that we analyze in terms of um, uh, readiness and if it's a concept, if it's uh, an already uh, available product in the market. And we connect all these uh, technologies to the demands of our clients. So, but to begin with our um, masterclass, I wanted to actually talk how this masterclass was a product of a beginning of a partnership and a friendship too, I may say. Uh, when I first talked to Roger, it was on LinkedIn. Uh, he was joining an event and he was talking about science fiction and innovation. And I was like super interested because I talk about this, but mostly in Portuguese since I'm Brazilian. And, and then I, I, I asked him if I could see his material. And in the end, we arranged a call, we talked, and we saw that we had a lot of interests in common and some complementary uh, qualities too. So we started working together in a project, in a project uh, of content. Uh, and we are writing about innovation, disruption, philosophy, all the things that Disruptive Futures Institute works, uh, works with. And one of the outcomes of this partnership was this joint article published at Inc. Magazine. And it represents both of our viewpoints on science fiction, innovation, and business opportunities too. And, but above all things, it was the state of our reality uh, that inspired us to think about the importance of using science fiction as a means to accelerate innovation or actually make sense of all this chaotic time we are living in, especially now with COVID-19. And I guess this quote by Arthur C. Clarke is very evocative. He said that fiction is more than nonfiction in some ways. You can create an universe of your own. You can stretch people's mind, alerting them to the possibilities of the future, which is very important in an age where things are changing rapidly. But bear in mind that Clarke died 
in 2008, meaning that if he thought that it was already too fast back in the day, now things are even faster. It's like we are taking a shortcut in a wormhole, right? So in spite of making things a bit more scary to scarier, uh, I think science fiction uh, or fictions in general are even more important now as a means to uh, actually arrange or organize our reality in terms of narratives. And then we can see what's happening and see how we can deal with it in a speculative uh, atmosphere. So it's safer for us to try possible actions towards our future. And then I think this is your part, right? <laughs> No, that's great. And uh, well, it's, 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 it's everyone's part. And both of us yeah, are. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, we, we're going to like that. <laughs> no, so this, this is a fun one. It's just with Lydia, we, we thought we'd take a step back and just put a half a dozen ideas, which some time ago seemed probably pretty absurd or impossible, and which then became reality. And so Jules Verne actually imagined um, <clears throat> in his book, The Earth to the Moon, that we would go to the moon and he wrote about that in 1865 so just over 100 years before 1969 when the first man was on the moon or Edouard Bellamy who wrote looking backwards and he wrote it um, in 1888 effectively for the first time I guess describing what what is a, a credit card <clears throat> or Arthur C. Clarke which Lydia just mentioned which was talking about in 1945, radio signals bouncing off satellites for long distance communications. And guess what? A few years later in 1957, um, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1. And then Dick Tracy, um, quite some time ago before the iWatch came out with the two-way wristwatch or, or Knight Rider. So these are some of the fun anecdotes. I think maybe just one point to notice, it's not necessarily on, on these particular examples, but with the exponential and accelerating pace of change, the gap of time between science fiction and science fact is probably reduced all the time. So we had, we looked with, with Lydia at quite an interesting study, um, which was done by Philip Jordan at the University of Hawaii, which as many of you know, one of the leading universities for, for foresight and many other things. Um, and this was picked up by an article in the MIT Technology Review, but effectively Philip Jordan et al, they studied the way researchers in, in human computer interactions found um, the usage of the terms science fiction in their work. And you can see the graph that it increases quite considerably over the past, I'd say, you know, 10, 15 years. And the observations were that science fiction plays a significant role for human computer interactions, which he took as a proxy, but that was, you know, to be able to be consistent with the material he had and the data. Um, but effectively, it's increasingly mentioned, even though the data he has, as, as we mentioned, is a, is a specific example. So it's just the tip of the iceberg. And so it's, it's just a fraction of the, the instances and the actual inspiration of science fiction. But it still shows that the exploration of new forms for hum, human computer interface and the availability and number of mentions in scientific um, papers that are unrelated to science fiction per se was increasing at quite a steady pace over the years. And that continues, of course. So when we look at different industries, and I, and, you know, I can talk from 20 years of, of M&A, where I advised a lot of the incumbent leading companies and who saw many new industries and many new players come out of nowhere and pretty much eat their lunch, even though they had been maybe established global leaders for decades. And so this is where you can see the importance of imagination and innovation. And <clears throat> whether it's for automotive, where it's not the OEMs, it's not Ford, it's not Volkswagen, it's not um, the, the European or the US auto manufacturers, but it's players like Waymo or Tesla, or even more interestingly, Nvidia, which is a chip manufacturer, which is pretty much going to be the operating system for the automotive industry. When you look at on the food side, it's not you know the leaders like Tyson or others, it's Beyond Meat or Impossible, which had the imagination for sustainable food tech and breaking the molds of the industry leaders like the Tyson Foods. Likewise, in payments, you don't see first data for payment processing. You don't see the banks or, or Amex. It's players like Adyen or Ant Financial in China, PayPal, Square. Space, of course, the commercial space is um, the partnerships with NASA where they're trying to commercialize space and make it more cost effective. 
um, is through through the commercial players. And and in tech media telecom, one of the most interesting areas I find is, you know, it's only in 2017 that Disney took over BAM Tech for streaming and took the control over that, whereas Netflix for decade, you know, for quite some time had been working on that. Or Zoom, you know, this year, it's only this year that Verizon realized that they needed to buy a small company called Blue Jeans to do enterprise grade video calls, which Zoom had been building for years. And so all of these things, it's really having the imagination and innovation as to what might be coming um, you know, in the future. Now, one, one area which I find quite important is that, and is that this beginner's mind is, is a reoccurring relevance and responsibility to stay relevant. And this is actually a, a calligraphy of a friend of mine, um, Nai. And this is Shoshin, the, you know, the concept in, in Japan, which is the beginner's mind. Sho means first, first time, and Shin is the mind and spirit. And so it's what Bezos uses for, in his own words, every day is day one. You need to stay relevant all the time. And so it's more than just sessions from time to time where you become imaginative. It's really thinking about what does it take every day to have that beginner's mind. And Tesla as an example is a great example because Tesla is not just that they've done electric vehicles a few years before others, it's that they are a software company. It's that they, every day they understand and they have probably 10, 15 years ahead of the manufacturers. They understand that you, can, you need to be a software company. They can basically update and roll out a new software in moments. And not only that, but they understand that they actually need to be an energy company. They understand what it is to develop the million mile battery and what their valuation, which is now about $600 billion, is driven by the fact that they've turned themselves into an energy company and actually not an automotive manufacturer. Or if you look at Slack, which has its origins in gaming, and Slack, which was in, you know, only created in 2009, which was just acquired for close to $30 billion by Salesforce, to help it compete against the Microsofts of the world on enterprise software. And so you can see something that happened through gaming that was very clever, but that had online productivity tools that fundamentally changed the way people work has its origins in online gaming. And that everyday innovation and imaginative way meant that it ended up being in pretty much only 10 years able to help compete against the likes of Microsoft, which was created, I think, in 1975. And the $30 billion tag, which Salesforce paid for Slack, is probably the second or third largest um, software acquisition ever made. So this is where you can see that it's a sandbox for innovation. You can see that when you have unconstrained external perspective, when you can imagine alternative realities or things which seem impossible, you're really not thinking about the future. You're actually thinking about your present. You're actually thinking about starting to develop and to imagine products, ideas today. And that imagination that becomes reality is fascinating because of course you have the Elon Musk's and the Jeff Bezos and all of these guys and many others who are very fascinated by science fiction. But if you take the movie, for instance, Minority Report in 2002, when Alex McDowell, who was a production designer, produced that, as a result of that, there were probably 100 patents on ideas which were floated in the movies, which were filed. And so you can see the way science fiction movie like Minority Report literally influenced the future, from driveless cars to wearables tech to 3D videos, biometrics, etc. So what, what companies use science fiction? Well, actually many companies, not just tech companies, but a lot of the companies which are legacy or traditional industries. Um, Lowe's, for instance, which is for home improvement in, in the US, combines augmented reality, virtual reality, and spatial computing for the customer experiences. Now, that is not a new idea today. IKEA, most of the players do, but a few years ago it was, and they came about it through a partnership and through brainstorming with Made in Space, they were thinking about producing home equipment tools, literally in the ISS station, you know, uh, the International Space Station in, in space. But when you look at Intel, which is really trying to, you know, it's the only large semiconductor player which is really competing against in, NVIDIA for the next generation of operating systems for cars. 
which is able to decode the implications of pervasive computational intelligence with sentient tools to understand convergent smart cities, autonomous systems, the convergence of AI, of, of uh, 5G, of internet, of things, and what all that will mean. And so they understand that the chips and the AI chips that they're developing need to be um, something which imagines a completely different world of mobility as opposed to just cars. And that is probably quite unique in most of the semiconductor players who are still assuming that the world is linear, stable, and predictable, and that they just produce semiconductor chips for the rest of the companies. So you can't go wrong with chocolate. Hershey's, as, a, as an example, they use science fiction a lot and uh, haven't tasted it. But uh, just for the kicks, this is, this is a 3D printing machine of, um, of chocolates. But they, you know, I think the idea here is they're thinking of a world where you pretty much produce chocolate at home or wherever you are. <laughs> So why, why do companies, and, and you know, we talk about companies, but actually innovation and imagination is as important, if not more, for individuals and for, for anyone. It could be governments, it could be all of us. It's not for companies necessarily, but why do companies, as an example here, use it? Well, the primary reason is that it's very, very hard to have imagination in the real sense, to imagine something that you cannot, that's just seems impossible or even worse than impossible you don't have the idea you don't know what you don't know and so i love in alice in wonderland lewis carroll's book um believing impossible things at some point you have the queen who's speaking to to alice and who used to say as a child i used to try and think about as many impossible things before breakfast and my you know she was quite proud of the queen that at some point she was able to think of six impossible things before breakfast time and and you really see um through this analogy how difficult it is but imagination can beat any strategic return analysis or any type of uh, you know short-term um linear financial analysis it, it starts conversations on areas which you can think about and develop you can then ideate and invent things you might not have thought about, injecting some crazy views, which again helps expand um, perceptions around assumptions you might make to explore product, products, productions, technologies. Also thinking about um, an area where Lydia spends a lot of time, the social impact, the human side, the ethical considerations around the products, because you're projecting in a world where these are concrete. Um, and you're doing that in a way that's not constrained, whether it's financial, whether it's technology, or whether it's simply the constraints of reality and our small, you know, sometimes quite specific minds where we think about the world in a, with a lot of assumptions and constraints. Here you have a complete blank page. So, so the real foundation is, is really a simple question. And, we all know the power of questions and some of the greatest inventions have arisen through simple questions and this question here is is what if what if we were to challenge the assumptions what if we were to question these what if we were to able to reconcile short-term thinking emergence with some long-term perspectives and not assume that there's a choice between the two what if we were thinking more broadly in terms of systems and, and the impact and the next order implications of things? What if we built in the storytelling? What if we transformed culture and integrated everything in a way where we prototyped all that through ideas, as opposed to having different specialist teams focus on a specific known problem? So this is really the foundation. It's really that simple question, which is what if? And when we talk about science fiction, uh, we should not see these narratives only as, fiction, as a fictional genre in which you, you will list some technologies and try to turn them into actual products or projects. In fact, many narratives are actually reflections on the consequences of these technologies uh, or in changes we may see in our society. Take these great dystopias of the past century, for instance. Uh, the book We by Zania Ting speaks about a so society where there's no privacy at all. People live in buildings made of glass and obey to a totalitarian government. Same goes for Huxley's Brave New World, but with a twitch 
when you think that soma is the perfect drug that makes everyone happy and sound. And it's funny to think that back in the day, this story was considered a dystopia where people were alienated by drugs. But today, if we could, uh, if we could actually bypass the, the stages of uh, adapting to psychiatric drugs, maybe we would be more happy or happier actually if we had so much to solve all the problems we have and after trying so many different drugs or medicine actually. <laughs> and well, if you also consider uh, 1984, a classic, very often uh, quoted as a reference for term for, for problems such as privacy. Uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, Orwell envisioned this society, totalitarian society, where information is manipulated, war is eternal, and people have no privacy, not even in their thoughts. I love the concept of a thought po police, for instance. Even in your thoughts, you could be committing a crime, a thought crime. I love this concept. And well, I love in, the, in a sense of <laughs> uh, uh, thinking about this, of reflecting on this concept, not that this is ideal. <laughs> and also, you have this collection of short stories, I, Robot, by Isaac Asimov, uh, in which he addresses how our world, oh, sorry, this is Night City, Sao Paulo, that's the city that inspired Cyberpunk 2077, and this is it. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, in 1950, uh, Isaac Asimov uh, wrote this collection of short stories, I, Robot, in which he discusses a world where robots are actually kind of household electronics. They are so often and so common in human life that we have another kind of society and other problems to be discussed too. And in fact, uh, Asimov was so important as both of fictional writer and a philosopher or a scientist, scientist because he was in fact a biologist, uh, that he created three rules of robotics that he uses along his fiction. But even nowadays, they are used as references for people who work with artificial intelligence and robotics. Even though they are kind of uh, limited nowadays, they are still an inspiration to think about the ethics of AI and ro robotics. And well, it started as a concept for fictional scenarios, and now we can use this even in scientific contexts of research. And to this point, even Honda uh, made a kind of uh, uh, gift or dedication to Asimov when the, he, uh, they created this robot called Asimo. And well, you can see that the connection between science fiction and scientific innovation can be as clear or literal as that. But on the other hand, we cannot uh, say that futurists or science fiction authors, writers can actually uh, predict the future. Uh, that wouldn't be not honest. In fact, when we see books like uh, Future Shock by Alvin Toffler, we see he's saying that no serious futurist deals with in prediction because nobody can really predict the future, but we can think about it and maybe build strategies on how to transform this future into something that we wish for or we aim for. And then one of the ways to do this is through this methodology called design fiction. Uh, one of the first person, uh, one of the first people to suggest this uh, methodology was science fiction writer Bruce Sterling. And basically he describes design fiction as a deliberate use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. Okay, what are diegetic prototypes? Prototypes can be anything. They could be a prop, uh, a movie, a short story. They could be even a performance, provided that it talks, it dialogues, it, it speaks with us and makes us believe in this scenario. It's created throughout this prototype. And it must be very well built and convincing to the point that we actually believe that scenario and we think about the consequences and why is it desirable or not desirable, preferable? Is it possible? We actually dive into this fictional scenario and then we can actually think about the possibilities to avoid or to make this fictional scenario true. And at Envisioning, we did also this first project, uh, not the first project with Swiss Army, but it was the first time we tried to combine science fiction with uh, future casting or 
trained foresight. And then we did this project back in 2019, I guess, no, 18. And we mapped emerging technologies, fictional, fictional technologies in works like uh, Neuromancer, Blade Runner 2049, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, and a game called Detroit Become Human. So we made a comparison between the fictional technologies we saw in, this, in these movies, games, and books, uh, and we connected to actual technologies or projects, concepts that are still being researched and put a rank according to NASA's TRL, Technology Readiness Level. So there is a difference between one and nine. One is an idea or a concept, and nine is already a product you can buy and it's already uh, known by people in general. This year, however, we did another project using science fiction and we created four uh, inter interactive narratives. One of them was created by me and I'm, I'm going to show this project for you guys because it's very interesting the way we work it uh, using science fiction narratives that you can actually, it's like a game. You can choose what you want for the main character. For instance, this is my story, Legaco, and it's about transhumanism, life extension, biotechnology, mind uploading. And then you can choose whatever you want for the story to carry on. And you have along the story, several technologies that are in different stages of readiness. For instance, we have uh, Avatar. Uh, we already have Avatar as a real actual functional technology nowadays. So we can see a short description of what is an Avatar and actually open a radar with all the technologies we map it in the other stories as well. So here you can see the map, the radar, the visualization envisioning has this proprietary visualization for emerging technologies. And you can check all the descriptions and all the, the level of readiness for each technology. So yeah, this is, this is available on, on our website. You just need to visit us at uh, envisioning.io. So back to the presentation. Oh, thank you, Yasmin. You, she sent the, the link on the chat. Another way to, to try to put science fiction in a more strategic way is also this kind of framework such as Futures Will. So you have this design where you can make, you can take a first trend or event or even a new technology and you can think about the consequences, the developments of this technology. So let's say for instance, CRISPR and how some scientists could be editing embryos. So what are the possible consequences, positive, negative, neutral? And then you can try to think about these ramifications of possible developments, developments after all. There is also another methodology called future cone where you do almost the same. You have this cone that represents visually the passage of time and you can put different scenarios uh, throughout this cone and you can make it closer to nowadays or further in the future. And there's different futures actually. There's the possible future, a plausible future, a probable future and a preferable future. So people can choose what scenarios are really that they believe it's possible or that they would like to live in. So it's a way to make this more strategical and uh, ease, make it easy for people to imagine and create these scenarios, these narratives. Another way is this card game called the Thing from the Future, uh, where you can make cards, like you print cards and you have an object. For instance, in this image, you have a jewelry. You have an emotion or feeling. In this case, we can see shame. You have a wild card, which could be uh, the time when this story can happen. So in five years, in the present, in 100 years, and then you have the possible outcomes. It's basically uh, inspired by Dator's um, frameworks of narrative. So it could be a transformative narrative. It could be uh, a continuation of what we, we have in the present. And then people can use it to create any kind of uh, diegetic prototype. So it could be a story, it could, could be a project, it could be a prop. I had some workshops where my the people who, who participated create a short scene and they interpret it as, as if they were actors. So there's a lot of possibilities when you have these kind of frameworks to work with um, uh, 
narrative creations. In fact, we have um, even a workshop on Saturday, but it's only in Portuguese uh, for science fiction creative writing. And also when we were talking about this project uh, and the narrative of Legaco, it's very, if you are interested in the future of that, we also have another panel about that. So I highly recommend, recommend you to follow this. And yeah, here are some examples then of this connection between science fiction and science fact. You can take from them. Roger, Fantastic. please. <laughs> so I'm gonna pause a few, few moments just to, to address one or two of the questions. Um, so a few things. First of all, for those who haven't read um, or come across the, the future narratives, I, it's, really, it's really amazing because it's a combination of emerging tech, meets science fiction, meets interactivity. And of course, Lydia's one is, is phenomenal, Lega Cow, if you haven't read it. So th that's really great fun. And <clears throat> there are two questions. I'm just going to take a break now, two minutes. We will have Q&A later. And Lydia, please chime in as well, or, or we can discuss it later. But just two questions that I saw pop up, and we might as well just cover them now. One was Fabio. I think if I remember the question, it was around why we just talking about companies and technology. Um, what about swarm intelligence or other factors? Um, a few thoughts there from, from my personal perspective. I think, first of all, I think I don't personally see technology as a particular sector or type of company or anything. I think technology is pretty pervasive now across any company, any industry. Um, whether one likes that or not, it's, it's a very sort of um, overwhelming, uh, pervasive um, aspect. And the second thing I'll say is that we're mentioning companies in the, in the context of corporate innovation, but it's not necessarily linked to limitations or to companies. It doesn't have to be linked to companies. I think on the contrary, it's a fantastic tool for individuals and the limitations of companies are because of also the challenges and the cognitive bias humans have in thinking about certain things. So we use companies, but at the other day, companies are just individuals and the individuals in companies have a cognitive bias, have trouble imagining the impossible. And therefore, these are frameworks where you might, you might find it useful, whether you're swarm intelligence and crowdsourcing or an individual or parent or, or company, but we're not necessarily thinking that this is just a sort of corporate environment. Sure, I agree with Roger. And also, I think this question comes from someone who likes cyberpunk, I guess. <laughs> so I can see the inspiration there. And we hope someday Cy cyberpunk manifesto and cyberpunk manifesto can be actually turning to reality, at least from my part. But yeah, for now, it's basically what Roger is saying. And then there was a second question around, you know, predictive modeling and how come they didn't see the pandemic or does predictive modeling work? Again, only talking from my personal perspective, but a few things. First of all, for those who are interested in, in uh, statistics and those kind of considerations, I really encourage you, if you don't know him well, to read um, Nicolas Nassim Taleb. He'll have very interesting and critical views around predictions, numbers, statistics, and that. And those are pretty pretty critical um, to really understand the limitations of statistics and probabilities, especially with the tail end and, and anti-fragile and fragile. So more for some other time, but, but do read Nicolas Nassim Taleb if you're interested in that. The second thing I would say around predictive modeling is that I personally believe that we are today in a very complex world and a complex world for me is a world where things are the unknown unknowns, cause and effects can only be determined ex post. And in addition to that, um, there are no right answers, which is different from a complicated world where there are known unknowns, where you can determine cause and effect ex ante, and where there are a range of right answers. Now that difference between complex and complicated, actually AI is very good in a complicated world, because there are known unknowns and because there is cause and effect. And there's a range of right answers. And AI is good in that and predictive modeling can be okay in that. But like many people believe, including not least Stephen Hawkins, the 21st century is a century of complexity. And therefore some of the features of complexity are potentially limitations in terms of predictive modeling. And anyway, that's my personal view for what it's worth, just interjecting. No, I agree, but go on. <laughs> 
So now to the examples, let's have some fun. And this is this is where, um, you know, you have a number of these situations where some of the venture capital companies or even in investors or even companies are looking for the more close to science fiction the ideas are, the more they'll invest. So there's actually a lot of startups and a lot of money going into to these companies. Arctop is a very interesting Israeli cybernetics company and brain computer interface. They, they moved recently, and I met them in Israel. They moved recently to San Francisco actually. And they have an AI based platform which constructs a multi-dimensional map of real time brain activity. So you're thinking, um, materializing Netflix's Bandersnatch using neural interfaces, basically. And their software is, is Neos, and they use proprietary algorithms to decode pretty much emotion, tension, and memory straight from the brain's signals. So they're going through billions of neurons for that. So pretty, pretty scary or, or interesting, depending on how one thinks about it. And another one which is um, which is interesting is core actions. Interesting slash scary. Um, you all know about Minority Report, or many of you will, and if you don't, check it out. But what is core actions doing? They're developing non-invasive software which identifies human interactions to so human intentions. Sorry, to prevent what might be a disastrous human machine interface error. So effectively, how close are you to anticipating what someone might do? And maybe you might get arrested if you're thinking in the wrong way. So we all we all love to love and love to hate um, Facebook, right? So Facebook acquired um, neural interface platform, uh, an impulse armband called Control Labs. They bought it for half a billion to a billion dollars. And it is not the brain neural impulses that is measuring it's just the electrical impulses for now from from the arms but how close are we and is that the precursor to brain computer interface but what we're going to look at now on the next slide is when they combine when facebook combines its projects around smart glasses when it has project orion and Facebook has a strategic partnership with Ray-Ban, whose parent is Luxottica, which is one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world. And this is reportedly going to be designed to, to take calls without necessarily being tethered to a smartphone. It's going to stream videos. And so what you're seeing is Oculus that's dematerializing sensors, controllers, and the smartphone itself to interact digitally in augmented environments. So you're pretty close to some of the things you might kind of think about a science fiction. Now, this is an amazing company, Mojo Vision. In fact, Lydia and I were speaking to the founder, Drew, um, earlier this week. And imagine it or not, but this is actually a lens. They raised $150 million, a little bit more to date, and they're working on an augmented reality contact lens. And so this is really invisible computing. It's reducing the friction between information and the brain. You have the smallest, densest dynamic display ever made. I think the pixel density is 300 greater than the best smartphones available. It has advanced R&D with biocompatible materials for embedded electronics. So not only do you have embedded electronics in the, in the, in the lens, but pretty much it replaces the ophthalmologist um, and the visits you might need to do for the medical. So. I hope not too many of you are training for that because you might have a lens that kind of replaces it. Um, and basically it has power sensors and communication. So it's a biosafe, rechargeable battery innovations. So that is autonomous. So I'll let you just imagine what's going on in that little lens. And of course you can choose any color you want. So how cool is that? Or scary. Now, Ready Player One, many of you might have seen that and, and know it. And a little company called Haptex, which raised um, $19 million, which is building the first haptic telerobotic system to transmit touch and feedback to an operator anywhere. And this is very, very fascinating. There's actually a, a, a researchers from Cornell University who are also developing a new pair of fiber optic gloves with sensors that track the hands with extreme precision. So it makes it possible to add tactic fe tactile feedback to the virtual reality experiences. So 
why is all this noteworthy? Well, the primary reason is because none of these developments in terms of technology are happening in isolation. What's happening is that you have convergence and fusion with digital synergies between 5G, between Internet of Things, between sensors, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and of course, artificial intelligence. So with artificial intelligence and machine learning, you have deep learning, natural language processing. And that meets artificial and immersive reality. You no longer know whether you're in real virtual life or in virtual real life. And then you meet some of the technology around brain computer interface or cybernetics, the brain computer um, communications. And so what happens when you can see, hear, touch or feel with the tech and the wearables? And that is also being combined and fused with the smell, with digital sense. So the reason we put this quote for Mich from Michio Kaku around, you know, once confined to, to fantasy and science fiction, time travel is simply an engineering problem, is because of the convergence and the fusion of all these technologies. When you have all the immersive, the brain computer interface, you can see, touch and feel, you can smell with digital scent, you have new materials technology or holographic displays and breakthroughs in nano manufacturing and nano engineering, how close are you then to digital teleportation or to space travel or to cyberspace or to time travel? And that is why we put this quote here and we're illustrating it because none of these technologies are static. They evolve quite quickly, exponentially, and they don't evolve in isolation. So as they converge and fuse, that's when you end up with all these science fiction, science fact. And well, Last but not least, we want to show this video. Maybe some of you guys already saw it, uh, but I think it's a great way to, oh, to wrap up our panel because basically what we see is Arthur C. Clarke, who was a scientist. He was a physicist and mathematician. And he basically talks about what he predicts for the year of 2001. But the great combination is that he had the scientific knowledge and he had the ability to imagine and to speculate uh, narratives. So when you see this uh, interviewer asking him about the future, you can see the power of uh, you have when you combine both scientific knowledge and imaginative uh, tools to create. So, yeah. Maybe 2001, you're projecting us into the 21st century. I brought along my son, Jonathan, who in the year 2001, will be the same age as I am now. Maybe he will be better adjusted to this kind of world that you're trying to portray. The big difference when he grows up, in fact, if we wanted to wait for the year 2001, is that he will have in his own house, not a computer as big as this, but at least a console to which he can talk to his friendly local computer and get all the information he needs for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in a complex modern society. This will be in a compact form in his own house. He'll have a television screen like this here and a keyboard and he'll talk to the computer, get information from it, and he'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. I wonder though, what sort of a life would it be like in social terms? I mean, if our whole life is built around the computer, do we become a computer-dependent society and a computer-independent individuals? In some ways, but they will also enrich our society because it will make it possible for us to live really anywhere we like. Any businessman, any executive could live almost anywhere on earth and still do his business through a device like this. And this is a wonderful thing. It means we wanted to be stuck in cities. We better live out in, in the country or wherever we please and still carry on complete interaction with human beings as, as well as with other computers. I find this video fantastic because basically what he sees uh, uh, is like a future where you have a lot of technological technological developments and new technologies that could make us, for instance, leaving the country, but still work and, and have contact with other people and other machines. And now during COVID-19, we saw that because basically we had all the technologies available to have uh, remote work. Uh, years ago, but our society didn't want this before. We needed a pandemic to adapt to this new format of uh, remote work. 
And even so, we try to run to the hills, basically, <laughs> but the rent uh, prices also increase. So there's a lot of complicated things, human elements that maybe are not really uh, addressed by some science fiction writers or some futurists. And this is why I always say that it's important to have diversity when writing science fiction and also working with uh, futurists, because you need different uh, viewpoints about the future and consequences that come with social, social change and also technolo te new technologies. And there's a quote by Bruce Sterling too. Uh, it's very interesting because if you consider that the uh, history of women were never uh, before uh, mentioned, studied uh, before 1970s, it's like ignoring the story, the history of more than half of the population of the world. So we need to have different viewpoints for the future. And that's why I always stress we need diversity in science fiction and also in futurism. So yeah. This is it. Thank you so much. And we are here for questions and debates and anything you want. And by the way, for everyone, when uh, Lydia showed, um, I think it was the three laws of robots of Asimov, um, that I think is 1950, so 70 years ago. And that's basically pretty much some of the key considerations of most of the ethics committees um, today on AI. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so, I guess there are some questions we didn't reply around the uh, along the the panel. I will recover some of them. We we answered about the cor corporations, companies. And there, Cla Clarice asked it. It it would be great to hear your vision around the difference between design fiction and speculative design. I've never came across any clear article that defined the difference between the two approaches. Well, there is an actual connection between the two approaches, but I guess uh, maybe design fiction is more uh, focused on science fiction, not necessarily with other kind of, kinds of fiction, as you can see, or speculative narratives when you talk about speculative design. But in the end, they are emerging, um, I guess, design fiction is even uh, more recent than speculative design. So these are two different methodologies that are still uh, developing and getting a real like uh, structured, 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 sorry, <laughs> sometimes it's language barriers and my tongue is like confused. But anyways, um, they're still being structured. It's not really that clear the difference for now, at least from my perspective and the studies I, I did. Do you want to add anything, Roger? No, not on, not on, on that. Um, I just want to come back maybe to, to the diversity point which Lydia made, because one of the interesting aspects, uh, the two aspects which cross my mind, one is the unintended consequences and the next order implications. And so projecting quite far ahead and science fiction is a tool, it's not the only tool, allows one to take into account all these different perspectives and, and that's obviously critical. But I, I wanna just link it also to the discussion we had earlier around predictive models and complexity and versus complicated. And without wanting to dwell too much on the specific point, because in a complex world, you don't necessarily have the right answers and you can't rely just on specialists because they're unknown unknowns and causality is only determined ex post in order to experiment and to emerge and to know what to amplify in terms of the right feedback loops versus dampen and stop, you actually need, you have to have diverse perspectives and multiple different kinds of experimentation because it's, it's really the only way you will emerge in a complex environment with sort of some answers and emerge with answers which seem to make sense. And so, science fiction which draws upon um, that element of diversity is critical as with any system which is not linear, stable or predictable. And so that's where I think science fiction in particular is, is one which almost draws that as a natural state because by definition you have a blank page, you lick, you're thinking about the next order implications and therefore you have to integrate all of these different possible considerations and diversity is obviously one of the critical ones. So uh, Bori sent a question. You, 
you mentioned Taleb and Kaku as futurists and important tech philosophers, writers. Any other you actively follow and recommend? You want to start, Roger? Um, yeah, so there, I mean, there are many. I think it, um, <clears throat> I think there are different, different fields and different kind of expertise. There's a, there are a lot of very important people in, in the futures, um, future studies, and obviously envisioning who's hosting this is doing so under the banner of UNESCO and futures literacy. And within futures literacy, there's a lot of events taking place all week. And there are a lot of very, very well-known people, including an amazing panel on anticipatory systems and um, which is taking place, I think, tomorrow under the UNESCO banner with people like Roberto Poli and uh, Riel Miller and Wendy Schultz and a few others who are some of the leaders in, in futures and who are actually part of a, um, a stream of of futures called anticipatory systems. And, and so there's a lot of those talks. So check out the UNESCO website on futures literacy. There's, there's aspects which are also purely, not purely, but which are very much emerging technologies. And so there are people like Ray Kurzweil, there are people like Peter Diamandis, there are a lot of people who, I wouldn't say they only have a focus on emerging technologies, but it's certainly one of the, the areas that's a strong focus on. Um, there's so many, we can maybe follow up um, separately. What I would say though, maybe, and I'll let Lydia add, add her amazing input as well, but part of the remit of the Disruptive Futures Institute is to give a better sense of what's happening and who to follow and what to look at. And so we are writing quite a lot of things, including a book jointly with Lydia, which will come out in H1 2021. And there'll be a lot of resources there, a lot of guidance on who to follow, who to read and all that. So if you generally follow on social media, Disruptive Futures Institute, as well as the many other wonderful organizations, um, we will be very intentionally guiding towards what we feel are very good resources. But Lydia, over to you. Yeah, well, uh, I would just add that there are some authors I follow that are not necessarily futurists, but they talk about future topics like cyber feminism or transhumanism. So uh, there is Monica Bielskite, who's um, she's, she's talk, she, she mostly talks about the concept of protopia and uh, indigenous futures too. Um, there's authors working on Afrofuturism that I follow several authors. I can, I, can I can send you a list of references I use constantly, links and websites I follow. But mostly I, I read some theories that are theories. They are not necessarily futurists. I like very much Douglas Rushkoff. He used to be a writer that was very enthusiastic about cyberspace back in the 90s. He wrote the book Siberia and nowadays he he does very hard or very crucial criticism towards uh, Silicon Valley and all the corporate culture in technology and singularity mostly. Uh, so yeah, and also there's, um, what's her name again? Uh, Margaret Worthing. She wrote a very interesting book I use for my, my PhD called The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. And she gives a historical panorama of how we developed our sense of uh, individuality and our perception of space since uh, Dante's Inferno un until nowadays with cyberspace. So there's a lot of different resources I use. And even I'm, I'm reading now a book called This History of Future by jo uh, Georges Minois. I don't know if there is a translation in English, but there is in French in, and Portuguese. And it's very interesting to see how throughout the history of the Western societies, we always had someone uh, talking about the future, being it through astrology or futurology. So it's very interesting to see how what we are doing right now, it's something that is crucial and very uh, in the roots of our societies. And Lydia, you, I mean, for those who didn't pick up at the intro, Lydia is actually amongst her many talents, a professional journalist, and she writes a column for, for y'all and many other things. So I think just following Lydia on social media as well is a, is a phenomenal wealth of uh, references and culture. Yeah. And, and that. Um, <laughs> actually, when I met Bruce Sterling, he uh, signed my book. Uh, uh, saying that I, my name would be Wikilydia because I have a lot of references like Wikipedia. So <laughs> you can follow me and I can give you more insight. 
That's Bruce Sterling saying that Lydia is wiki Lydia, so you can yeah. imagine how much <laughs> help there is there. Um, <laughs> the, so I was just, just thinking there's one question here, which... Um, Maybe uh, Andre McQueen? Uh, let's see. W which one is it, Lydia? Andre McQueen sent a question about Octavia Butler. And there's also Eduardo's question. Do you think that the recent technological advances are making it harder or easier to science fiction authors? Uh, ah, it's, it's harder because reality is more chaotic and make, making no sense. Whereas when you write fiction, you need to be rational and convince people that that scenario is possible. But reality is much crazier than we can <laughs> make in fiction. So yeah, it's hard times for science fiction writers. <laughs> Yeah. The I, I um, so I, I'm obviously less of an expert, and I'm not myself a science fiction writer on that. So I'll give my kind of slightly more um, a different perspective. I I I think I would agree that it's probably harder for science fiction writers, although I don't know for a fact. And so Lydia's answer works better because she actually is a science fiction writer. But what I would say is that the way I perceive it is that the gap between science fiction and science fact, to Lydia's points about reality being crazy is is reduced and some of it is because of the world being you know people understanding that the world is not something which is straightforward predictable linear some of it is also and i don't want to say everything is technology but i think technology has an important role in that in in other words the examples we looked at with the movies with specific startups are technology driven and these technologies are advancing quite quickly for some of them. And even if you think about space and space exploration, or if you think about some of the, the, um, the specific technologies, and when you then think about the fusion and the convergence of all these technologies, that much more so. So I guess the, the question for me is really, you know, are we limited to, to that and to imagining that? And how far can we, can we stretch the imagination? And I guess, and again, Lydia's probably better to talk about these things than me, but when you think about some of the areas like solar punk or aspirational, should one be thinking about making that um, the reality with you know, regeneration and climate and some of the other areas, as opposed, and that was a very good question, I think from Fabio, to having it too technology centric. You know, what is, what is the role of imagination and I guess science fiction, and maybe I'll throw that question to you, Lydia, for, for some of the things which are not the day-to-day -day emerging tech, which are not the more obvious around space and, and how, how do you perceive that as uh, interesting enough for the science fiction genre, credible enough? What, do you have a view on some of the more, maybe slightly alternative areas? Well, it depends because science fiction is a broader genre. You, you have many other subgenres inside science fiction like solar punk, cyberpunk, steampunk, diesel punk, biopunk. There is a lot of punks and also like retrofuturism, afrofuturism. And then I connect to Andrea's question about Octavia Butler because she became a very strong reference when we talk about afrofuturist perspective, racism, and well, I, I, alongside uh, Samuel, what's his name? I, I forgot, Delany. Yeah, Samuel Delany. He was a contemporary writer to Octavia Butler. And Andrea said that this approach maybe doesn't appear to be taken by brands and lecturers such as this, despite societal, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that, societal conversations around diversity and representation being extremely important in 2020 alone. Do you see this changing? Well, we are trying to do our part. I try to bring these ideas when I give my talks and there's people like Monica Bielsky talking about indigenous futures and envisioning we try to bring all these uh, different perspectives to. If you check our Medium uh, publication, you can see, for instance, some texts, texts we wrote for the future of cities. And then you can see different aspects and, and that are not necessarily uh, the mainstream opinion on only business, but also social change and, uh, and also politics, sustainability, and so on. But to, to answer Roger's question and also Fabio's, 
I think it depends on the kind of question you're addressing and what the problem you would like to, to solve. Because for instance, in the fiction of Ursula K. Legging, you have lots of discussions about uh, gender roles or maybe different uh, economic and political systems in like in a planet, it's capitalism in the, it's moon, it's anarchism and how this works in this fictional uh, scenario. So you need to find what, what is your interest and then you can find most of the topics being addressed either in literature, uh, cinema, games, science fiction is a very rich uh, genre you, and you can find in any kind of format different perspectives on the future and different issues too. I don't know if I answered, but it's a very broad <laughs> answer. So I don't know how I can do this in some minutes only. Now oh, that's amazing. And, <clears throat> and what else do we have? So there is reality, virtual reality and science fiction. Virtual reality equals science fiction. No, not necessarily. Virtual reality is true. Like I always show my, <laughs> my Oculus Rift, this is true, it's not science fiction anymore, but it's used it to be. And well, actually I, I was talking to someone on my LinkedIn that wanted to write an article about that, that there is no difference between reality, physical reality and virtual reality. So in terms of philosophy, maybe there is no difference, but in terms of pragmatism, maybe, it has a difference because it's physical or digital. Lydia, can you address the false dichotomy of art versus technology or nature versus technology, language and categorization getting the way more than we realize sometimes? Yeah, I can write a PhD about that actually. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but it depends on the author. You can see some authors making this difference between nature and technology, nature and culture, but there are, other, there are other authors that wouldn't make this difference and language, you would have the perspective of linguistics or you would have philosophy of language with Wittgenstein, for instance, who uses language as a means to, to approach reality. So <laughs> I don't know how to answer this in a simple way, but yeah, it depends. It could be a false dichotomy or it could be really distinct things depending on the author you're, you're using as a reference. For me, I think there is a difference because I take the uh, psychological perspective, for instance, from Ernest Becker, Denial of Death. Uh, basically, he says that we try to repress nature power, nature forces, uh, trying to repress our consciousness of death, and then we create art and technology as a means to survive as a symbolic uh, being, because we are not just animals, we are animals with a higher level of consciousness compared to other animals. So we create language, culture, technology as a means to um, oppose to nature's force. It's very philosophical, it's very sad maybe, but it's something I really dig to, to research and we can talk more uh, elsewhere. Thanks for the question, Hafa. And I guess the question is, how does all this change if uh, we all live in a simulation? Because apparently there's 50% chance that we all live in a simulation and that none of this is reality. So that's one of the things we have to spend a bit of time thinking about. Yeah, that too. Because if you take like Nick Bostrom, he wrote that article about, are we living in a sim simulation? And many people, including Elon Musk, thought that maybe we are, or I th he thought we are. So it's very interesting to see these and very mind blowing. You can be very crazy when you're researching and <laughs> reading this kind of stuff. Hmm. So yeah, we are past six minutes past, but we are free to keep talking or in our social media. I think Yasmin put the links from our social media here. Ah, sorry, there's a question by Ivan. I would like to ask you, if you could talk a bit further about the connection of sci-fi movies and technological development. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so if you check our radar uh, for DevTech, uh, Yasmin, if you, could, if you can put the link for the DevTech, you can see the connection we've made for the movies and the games and real 
actual technologies and how we rank them in terms of technology readiness level. So it's more clear there. You can see the text, also the introduction explaining how we did this. And we are, we are actually writing an article, a paper about the, the methodology we use in this project. So hopefully we'll be presenting this uh, in the near future and it's going to be published too. So yeah, there is lots to be done. <laughs> So a good point by JT around being in a simulation does not necessarily make life less real. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the simulation I am in, when I compare it to my life in a simulation versus my real life, I find distinct differences, but I see what you're saying, JT. <laughs> Elon is also unsure, but uh, he's unsure about many things, depending on... Is there some example of past or recent sci-fi speculation about people wasting their life on narcissistic social media flow and gate community platform? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Black, uh, Black Mirror, I guess. <laughs> but more than that, yeah. Uh, one interesting fact about that actually I wanted to, to mention is I just read, um, what's his name again? Mark Fisher's uh, Capitalist Realism. And basically what he says is that many uh, fictions address this criticism against capitalism and all these narcissistic social media and so on, all this consumerist cu uh, culture we have nowadays. And it's basically, it's a kind of strategy from capitalism in his point, from his point of view, because then we feel satisfied from consuming, from reading, watching this kind of content, because then we, we feel like we are woke to this kind of problems. And then we buy and then we consume these kind of products. It's very, it's very scary when he brings in this way. But yeah, I mean, Black Mirror is the most recent uh, title I can remember now in terms of narcissistic social media flow and get community platforms. There's also Weird, Weird City, a series from YouTube. Um, the first episode is marvelous because it's basically like a Tinder and they matched two guys and they were like, whoa, I don't like guys, I'm, I'm not gay and so on. But if the algorithm united us, so maybe we are, we are the perfect match. And then they started to talk, they go out and then they actually fall in love. But then the, the company from this app says that, no, we, we made a mistake, you weren't supposed to, to have a match. And then there's this discussion about algorithms and how real, how right, they are in face of what they actually felt after meeting each other. So, yeah. Yeah, the concept of Maya. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I actually use it in my fiction, but it's only in Portuguese for now. I, I, I want to translate it. But basically, my short stories are a connection between cyberpunk and Buddhism and Hinduism. And I use the concept of Maya as, a, as an inspiration when the main character links uh, tries to make difference between the virtual world and the real world, and she's a junkie, and all those cyberpunk tropes everyone is tired of, but yeah, I like that. <laughs> and also Bruce Sterling's Holy Fire, uh, it's a very interesting book, and the name of the main character is Mia, but then she goes under a procedure of rejuvenating, and she becomes Maya, because they don't understand her name or whatever, and then there is this play with the the terms. I interviewed him and, and he said that that's the case. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> what else? Could you apply sci-fi science fiction methodologies to operational decision making, e.g. in a leave police hostage situation? Oh my god, Roger, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> To operational decision making. Um, I mean, nothing springs to mind specifically, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by operational, whether it's kind of real time on the spot for something. I mean, have you used science fiction to imagine a situation you wouldn't have thought of? 
and then by virtue of having thought about it if when if and when it arises it, you're then better able to so I, I i think i don't know about live hostage taking but i think one of the things one looks at is ultimately the primary you know one of the main reasons for using science fiction is for imagination and so imagining different eventualities and possibilities that might arise some that you want agency for and you want to build and you want to do or some for which if they arise you're better prepared i guess that probably is helpful in in that sense um uh, yeah i i don't know if Lydia, if you have anything to add there's a there's a nice question also on digital collective unconscious um yeah and i don't know if that's sort of playing with sort of swarm intelligence and other kind of possibilities uh but uh, it is uh, a theme. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hafa asked, it, what about digital collective unconscious? Yeah. We consider technology separate from us. Therefore, it's in our shadow, to use Carl Jung's term. If we were to own it and see it as a reflection of us, it could turn into a white mirror as opposed to a scary black mirror. Yeah, if you consider shad the shadow from... Uh, Jung's perspective as a means to transcend the dark parts of your own identity. But yeah, there is another concept called noosphere. I, I will wrote, uh, I will write this on the chat, and it's uh, widely used in the sense of a digital, virtual, collective, unconscious. And you can see this term being explored in serial experiments, Lane which was the Japanese animation I studied in my first research, my undergraduate research, where everything started and now we are here. <laughs> uh, Psychofanti asked, what is your PhD about? Is it ongoing or already finished? I'm finishing it. It was supposed to be finished this year, but COVID saved me and gave me more time. But basically, it's about the history of art and how we try to transcend death uh, with images since the portraits from Renaissance until uh, post-mortem photographs and now more currently with digital or actually virtual avatars. So I study some artists including Andy Warhol, uh, Gottfried Helwein, um, Damien Hirst and specifically the funeral of Michael Jackson and finally, Bjork and Grimes as inspirations to think about how these different artists approached the concept of trying to transcend death through images. So it's complicated, but it's, it's basically that. And I'm, it's in Portuguese for now, but yeah, that, that's the problem. I need to write more in English so more people can, can have access to the content, but it's in the list. Thanks for asking. <laughs> So there's a question from Stephanie. I don't know if it was in the Q&A for everyone or just for, but I'm reading it. I'm reading it just in case. Often in sci-fi, there seems to be the dichotomy between human ethics versus technology, as well as power versus the powerless. What are your thoughts, especially when talking about companies and the effects of tech on our world? And well, I mean, Lydia chime in, but for me, one of the roles of science fiction and one of the roles of uh, you know foresight and futures more generally is actually to be very broad and multidisciplinary and, and Lydia mentioned many times diversity and I think the important thing are the unintended consequences and the next order implications and so I personally think that science fiction is quite a strong way of thinking not just about tech but more broadly around um, human ethics and uh, a lot of other areas, precisely because you're, you're really imagining in a quite an intricate way, all the different aspects of what life could be at a specific point in time. And that level of imagination and then imagining also the negative and the risks probably allows you or hopefully forces you to, to sort of think more broadly about those things. As to then how they're integrated when people design products and all that, that's another matter. But Lydia, I know you, you spend a lot of time on these topics. No, but I mean, uh, there's many science fiction narratives that talk about this, these inequalities and so on. But sometimes it's difficult, it's difficult to address these kind of subjects in a corporate environment. But I always try to do this in uh, bringing design fiction or science fiction as a reference instead of pointing the finger to actual problems that happen like 
Musk's talking about Bolivia and so on. But you can use science fiction uh, stories to, to address some pro real problems. Let's take, for instance, Handmaid's Tale. It's about reproductive rights. It's about uh, sexism and so on. You don't need to point and say, oh, this is about Trump or Bolsonaro. But it's clear there. It's a metaphor. Uh, actually, Margaret Atwood, which is the, the author of Handmaid's Tale, she says that uh, science fiction doesn't talk about the future, but rather, uh, rather, rather about the present, but in a more uh, metaphorical way. So you can speculate and you can extrapolate what is actually happening. And then you can distance yourself from the actual problem and think that as if it was someone else's or for, from somewhere else. And then you have this distance to reflect and criticize the, the topic or the scenario. So yeah, I try to bring that to using science fiction. And it's funny because not all the times people recognize the politics behind science fiction. Let's Let's take the example of Cyberpunk 2077 and how in Twitter some people were super angry with uh, CD Red, Red Project because they didn't want to have a game uh, addressing political stuff. And then everybody was like, but Cyberpunk is totally political. If it's not political, then it's not <laughs> Cyberpunk. So it's very interesting to see how some things are born as a as politics, and then they become a product, and then they are emptied from this criticism they usually did. So cyberpunk, for instance, became as a subgenre that talks about cybernetic technologies from a punk perspective. So with a punk criticism and nihilism and the quote of no future brought from Sex Pistols, and, and then you have all the uh, the genre uh, and all the tropes, all the concepts emptied as long as they become products in the end. So nowadays, cyberpunk, if you check some groups on Facebook, for instance, it's mostly to share the picture or illustrations of hot women with uh, prosthetics. So it's sad, but yeah, commercialization. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the problem. It's always capitalism. Yay. No, <laughs> joking. But yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. So any other questions or shall we say goodbye and see you later on social media? Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining Thanks. us. This session is being recorded. You can check afterwards in YouTube on YouTube. And yeah. Ah, Michelle. Yes, please. Well, I just want to say goodbye and thank you so much for doing this, you guys. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation to listen into, and I'm and I'm judging from the from the Q and A from the questions, everyone seemed to have felt that way. So thank you so much. Let's do more of this and advance the conversation, and um, sign up for other sessions. We have two more days ahead of us. Uh, yes. So we're still only a day into the summit, um, so I hope to see more of you guys. Yes, okay. please check our schedule. There's a lot of talks, very interesting talks uh, hosted by Envisioning. I think there's a link here in the chat. So yeah, hope to see you again in the next panel. Thanks everyone. And thanks Envisioning for, for having us. Ciao. 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 Ciao.